Please welcome Greg Kinnear, Sepeda Moffey, Paul Walter Hauser, and Taryn Edgerton. Welcome, gang. Um, hey. Thank you for coming out, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Greg, I'm going to Paul Walter Hauser, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> TV and film and stages, Greg Kinnear, everybody. <laughs> yeah, Greg, I actually want to start with you. Um, um, Dennis Lehan, the writing, is so precise, but there is only, there's two bits of info that we find out about your character. One is that the first time we see him, he's at a football game with his daughter. And then we also find out that uh, when he was in the, in, in the military, he, he defused bombs. And I, I was just so fascinated by those two details. Did that help you build the character? Uh, yeah, that was kind of uh, the first conversation I had with uh, Dennis. And, you know, I felt like, uh, you know, I, I've never played a detective before. I do not get asked for this kind of role. And uh, I, I really liked the, um, the emotional element uh, invested for, for Brian Miller right off the, the bat. Like you say, he's watching his daughter and, and that kind of informs everything about his pursuit of this. Yes, he's, you know, very specific about his actions and he's, he's detailed and he's methodical given his, you know, background. But there's also a heart to what he's doing that is tied to his own um, existence and and uh, and I feel like it, that made you know what what he was going through um, more personal. Um, yeah, correct. I mean, the fact that he's he's a, a father and the you know the daughters are so meaningful to, to him. And then when we find out about Jessica down the road, um, did that did that feed into every scene that you were doing? Well, you know, we, I've said before, we, we did a table. I, I, these guys are bored by this because we've all had the same conversation over this. But we, <gasps> <laughs> She's yawning as I'm saying it. I have never been bored from a Greg Kinnear performance, and neither have any um, of you, and you know it. So, no, but I, I felt like we, we, we definitely had a very long table read. This is a six-hour event, and we did, in COVID, a table read to end all table reads. And it's not exactly a lot of fun to actually do a table read, read under any circumstances, but this was long and I was so dreading it. And the moment we all got in front of each other and the moment that this thing came alive on a Zoom in COVID, I felt, I think we all did like something. We crushed it. Basically. Yeah, we were incredible. We crushed it. There was something, there was an energy in it that was real and palpable. You felt it, and every character kind of uh, popped off the page. And I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I wish Dennis were here. He's, uh, he is our, you know, our North Star and all of this and wrote uh, just such a dynamic and beautiful piece of work. So every character knew what their job was, and in terms of the whole tapestry of the story, there was really something great to pursue here. Mm -hmm. um the recruitment scene, which actually you all saw, it's, it's Shakespearean. It's like almost like a whole monologue by yourself. Can you tell us about when you read that scene and then tackling that that? It's an amazing, and you do a great job. I mean, Lauren utters just a few words before you get a real introduction as to who she is. And it's um, the raid scene. You see her, and she says a few things. But then it's in the courtroom scene where you really get to know her. Um, you see her. She doesn't peep a word, but you see her observing everything and just eating everything up. I mean, she's ravenous. And... The way that Dennis had it written in the script was that she lights up. Everybody else would be bored by this job, but Lauren lights up like a Christmas tree. She's addicted. She's absolutely obsessed with her work. And so, I mean, really, this, this is a testament to Dennis's work, his writing. Um, his, his, his scripts are like a blueprint, and they didn't 
change much. I mean, the bulk of it didn't change much. There was a sequence that had to change, but um, in general, everything was, it was pretty consistent from start to finish. And so when you have that kind of support, you are able to anchor into the words, into the script, into the story, into the characters. And in my experience, Lauren popped out of the, out of the script for me. Um, I think Laren in our, I mean, Taryn in our, Laren, in our last panel um, said that, you know, these are parts of ourselves that come out in these characters, and I really relate to that in my process. It's that we embody, that we have all of these characteristics in us, um, and it's about what kind of shines through for the character, and sometimes you have to work hard at finding these things in a script, but with Dennis Lehane, you don't have to work at all. It just kind of eats you up, and as a result, whenever you're speaking the words, whenever you're, you know, working, you're, you're there on the day, you really don't have to work too hard because you are so supported by the text. And so that scene, like you said, it's kind of a tour de force Seen and and you see all the ways in which Lauren is able to shift and she's able to manipulate this person who has never been manipulated in his life. He's always been the manipulator, um, and so immediately you see that this is a pair that is going to be thoroughly entertaining together and that they have kind of met their match. Did you tagging on to what you just said when I was watching the show mm -hmm. I felt like you guys were similar. Mm -hmm. There's like two yeah. sides to the same coin. Did That's you right. guys play on that? I, I don't think we talked about that necessarily. I mean, Taryn and I both have a theater background and we love the work. We love to dive in and go deep. Um, but I don't think we talked about that necessarily, but we did rehearse, we talked about the scene, and something that I really loved about working with all of these actors um, and Taryn in these scenes um, was that you know he won't stop until we get to a place of absolute truth, you know? Um, He's not afraid to stop the process, to slow the process down so that we can really dig in and get to the meat of the scene. Um, and actors, so actors like me, first assistant directors, <laughs> do, do not like me. No, but it's refreshing because so often, especially in television, they're just trying to, I mean, you run through the scene and then you shoot it. And if something felt right, we would do that. But if it didn't feel right, we felt, and he empowered us, you know, his colleagues, I can speak for myself, he empowered me to really indulge in this way. And I mean, it wasn't gratuitous at all. Um, it was always connected to the truth, which mm -hmm. ultimately, once we found the truth, the process would speed up. Paul, masterful Paul, um, the the voice. I'm you just, call me massive? Uh, no, <laughs> masterful. Oh, okay, that's better. It's got to check my adjectives. Oh Sorry. my god, you made me so self conscious now. Um, uh, the, you think you're self conscious? I thought you called me massive in front of seventy five people. Well, massively talented, Paul. I'm gonna add that to the IMDb trivia, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> massively talented. No, what's uh, up? Sorry. Um, the the. Tell me how you arrived to that voice. Um, it, it, I've, having seen the show a couple of times now, I noticed that you, you switch the pitch of his voice. When he's telling a lie, it goes to a higher pitch. Am I right? No, totally. Very perceptive, because I, I, actually, I actually got a little bit, and, and I've been very vocal about this, which maybe isn't good, because it makes me look like I screwed up, but. Um, at least it's honest, which is I started in episode one and two with the more realistic version of Larry's voice. It wasn't so much like he had been punted in the groin. Uh, the first two episodes are more honest where it's, it's kind of wayward like this and he's just uh, talking like he's tired. And then by episode three, I started to lose the voice a little bit. And I did, I talked to Adam Driver about this on Black Klansman where I was like, hey man, and he's such a good actor and I was like a supporting character in this movie and I was like, hey, uh, do you ever feel like you're losing the voice? Because I had to do a southern accent for Klansman. And he goes, all the time. You're always second guessing it. You're always thinking you suck. You won't, like, and he went off on it and it made me feel better because that was one of those times where I did start to kind of lose a voice and went in a higher register and Dennis kind of pulls me aside and goes, 
you know, we can use this to our advantage. You know, it's part of his, you know, predatorial uh, strategy. You know, he's 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 going to abuse those vocal changes and use them uh, with purpose. And so, around episode four, I started doing that very thing and and trying to find fun ways to weaponize it uh, while hoping it wasn't distracting at the same time. Um, can you also? Tell, tell us about that mental detachment that your character goes into where there are moments we just saw in this episode where you seem to be zoning out. But, you know, how did you arrive to that choice? Um, that, that was definitely in the script on the page. Dennis had moments where he wanted the character to kind of look off um, and, and have that moment either for the reason of the flashbacks in episode four or um, for reason of him going somewhere in his mind and then having to breadcrumb trail his way back and, and get back into uh, Jimmy Keene's head. So that was there, but I definitely tried to have some creative license and fun with it. I, I studied Vincent D'Onofrio in Full Metal Jacket a little bit. And I kind of, you know, I did one sort of Kub Kubrickian, uh, you know, slack-jawed stare where it's like the soulless stare in his movies. And, uh, and I think they kept that in the show. It's terrific. Um, Taryn, great job. It's such a challenging role. Um, you, I, I'm amazed in scenes that you seem to be amused by his character seduced by him, you're seducing him, but at the same time, you're repulsed by him. Tell us about how were you able to navigate that dynamic? Uh, well, I think that's the brilliance of what Dennis is able to capture. Life is so not about um, absolutes and binary opposites. And, um, you know, there are always moments of contradiction in any relationship. And, and I think what's really exciting about the dynamic between Jimmy and Larry over the course of the series is, yeah, Jimmy's repulsed by Larry, but actually what really fucks him up and is what really costs him and damages him over the course of the show is that he also sees himself in him in some ways and he sees Sure, a far more extreme, distorted version of misogyny, but he is also particularly, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm guessing that a lot of you have seen the show in its entirety. By episode four, they have a conversation where they really, where Jimmy does break through and he does manage to get him to start talking about what he's done. And he starts to ask him about the specifics of that. And um, Larry says, I, it's a really shocking moment, and it comes out of nowhere, and Paul is, I mean, frankly, sublime in that moment. He sort of takes this deep breath, and he says, you know, I soak, a, I soak a, a, a rag in starter fluid, and I cover their mouth with it, and I throw them in the back of the van. And Jimmy is repulsed and horrified. And Larry turns to him and goes, what do you use? Mm. And Jimmy just reflects, and you see this real fast cut of all these women that he's plied with this drink. And another thing that's very subtle that you might not notice in the show, but there's a, in this episode, you know, where he meets the waitress and takes her home, he has a glass of, he doesn't drink. He doesn't drink the drinks he drinks. They get drunk. He gives them cocaine. He's not really taking it himself. He's not really drinking it himself. There's a sort of, there is a predator in Jimmy as well. Mm -hmm. Not to the same extent, but it is in him. And that's part of his arc because he recognizes in Larry something of himself. He, he, he looks into the void and he sees a little bit of himself and that's what breaks him and it's what, it's ultimately why he becomes a better man at the end of it, but it's also the reason what Dennis does so brilliantly at the end of the show is you see Jimmy trying to get on with his life but knowing that he's never quite gonna come back from it because he knows fundamentally it's in his nature. I mean, I am gonna ruin the end of it if you haven't seen it. If you haven't seen it, you've had a year, it's your own fault. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, well, but it's it, also based on a true story and we know. Yeah, yeah. But um, at the end of the show, he's on a plane and what Dennis, Dennis writes this scene where he meets a, a, a waitress and he kind of turns back into the old Jimmy. 
And uh, he has this sort of like interesting little encounter with her. And then she walks away and he can't help but check out her, her bar. Mm -hmm. And then he turns back and he sort of looks very pleased with himself and looks out the window and looks down at the ground and imagines all the places there could have been a body. And, and, you sort of, and, you, and he looks at the front of the seat and just takes a drink and you realize he's never quite gonna fully recover. And what Dennis does so brilliantly is he puts Lucky Man over it by the verve and it ties back to a really much earlier part in the show where one of the, one of the cops who transport him from the low security prison to the high security prison, they're all talking about their life and what they have in their lives and kids and wives and family. And they say, what about you? You got kids, you got a wife? And he goes, no, none of those things. And he goes, lucky man. Mm. And it's, it's kind of, I, I, I don't really know what I'm saying, but there's a, the, I, I, Dennis is really fucking clever. Um, <laughs> but I, as a follow up, you transform yourself physically and the, the narcissism in the character is so upfront. You know, tell us about that choice of you physically transform yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, um, I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to say that I look like that without my clothes on now, and I, I, uh, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Is that a stunt ass? <laughs> it's absolutely not a stunt ass. I worked very hard for that ass. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, but it's it's in the it's it's you know it's not. You know, I didn't do that because it's not a superhero movie. I didn't do it because I was getting my clothes off. It's because he is, he's a, he's a narcissist. He's completely self-absorbed. He's completely in love with himself. And he spends his whole life looking in the mirror and working on his physique. And it's, it's part of his character floor. It's part of his A so that there is a B to arrive at. Mm -hmm. I don't look bad with my clothes off, by the way. I just don't look, just don't look quite that good. <laughs> Let's just say we all discovered our pause button in episode one. <laughs> I think it was Paul or one of you addressed, mentioned the dynamics. And having seen the show a few times, there's such interesting, interesting dynamics between all of you, Greg and, and Sepede. Your dynam dynamic is so interesting. It's like a father-daughter relationship, all friends. You have gone through so much. Um, Separate you and Taryn have at times this sexual tension and other times it's like enemies. Can you tell, uh, do, is that something that you guys worked on, the different layers to the dynamic between all of you? I don't think we talked about it, but again, it goes back to the script. It's all there, it's all available, and if you're open to it and you're met with actors who are interested in exploring and diving in, and you know, as a master teacher, Harold Guskin would say, explode the moment, um, then that's exactly what happens because you're supported. Anything is supported here. Um, yeah, I think all of these, when I first met Greg, I mean, I was a huge fan. Um, I don't often get starstruck or, um, you know, uh, get in my head about these things, but I was very excited to meet Greg and work with him. And it was disarming meeting him because he's so humble, he's so down to earth, and immediately off screen before we even got on camera, um, we had just such a, an ease and a comfortability with each other, and I think that translates to screen. I mean, it's our job to show up no matter what, but whenever you feel comfortable and open and safe with the people that you're working with, it becomes so much easier. You don't have to work as hard. Um, and so I think that definitely translated in our dynamic, and it felt like even like the micro sort of energies, moments in each scene, um, we were able to fly and we were able to really take each other in and listen to where the scene was going with the two of us rather than try to sort of manufacture something. Um, so I think, it, you know, it's twofold. It's the script and it's the energies of the castmates. And I, I personally just haven't had the luxury. I've worked with phenomenal actors before, but I haven't a cast this strong and this connected and this sort of committed to excellence and uh, with no ego and full humility. I, that's just, it's, it's beautiful and um, rare to this degree. Mm -hmm. um, Greg, I know that you grew up in Indiana 
and closed by to the proceedings. Were you familiar to the happenings, to the to Larry's? You know. Yeah. No. 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 I, I did. I grew up in a small town uh, in Indiana, Logansport. Yay! I know. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I uh, it, it, which is down the street from where uh, Larry Hall's, you know, s s you know, was from, and where uh, much of the horror took place. Didn't know the story. Left. Uh, I left there when I was young. But uh, you know, this was a discovery actually when I first read the script and talked to Dennis and just did my own little, you know, Google on the whole thing. I was like, holy shit, this is Larry, H and put that together and kind of used it as a selling point as to why he needed to cast me. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I was just thinking, because in this first episode, uh, I know it ends with the interrogation, right? And that was, was that day one? It was. I think it's day one of shooting this entire thing. So I go into that room, and I'm sitting opposite Paul, who's very, you know, like, well, I hadn't really figured it out. And I was like, I hear this, and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Because I remember being so sort of arrested by how accurate, how perfect it sounded, how scary and disarming it was. So, uh, yeah, no more selling yourself short, kid. It's, it was fantastic from day one, literally. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, I have to add, even in the Zoom table read that Greg mentioned before, this was two days. The first day we read episodes one to three, and then four to six was day two. And episode four, after episode four or five, um, we we had to take a break because we were sobbing after Taryn and Paul were just reading off the page. I mean, they were fully in it, but it was so just their commitment, their uh, what they brought to the table even before we started a rehearsal process was arresting and I was sobbing and I was not the only one who was just crying on the Zoom and Dennis literally called the break after. Yeah, it's really interesting. As actors, we often uh, like that you, I think we're all guilty of trying to get ourselves to cry at certain moments because you feel like you're doing real acting, you know, you think, wow, I'm really... But no one tries to cry. No one ever tries to cry. You only ever try not to cry. And on that Zoom, there were a few moments where it just, you can't really fake it. You can see when someone's faking it, and the way I know is because I go, oh my God, I'm crying. I didn't mean for that to happen and it's not the be all and end all it's not a testament to a great scene it's not a testament to a great actor but there's definitely something about it happening before you know it happens and that happened on that zoom yeah there was it was the idea that you can't usually you can trace the origin of why you're crying or how you revved yourself up and there were a couple really nice organic moments where everybody was authentically emotional but but that's a testament once again to everybody Everybody, you know, sometimes it, we, we've all worked jobs. Let's take it out of the acting thing for two seconds. <clears throat> you've been a part of a losing job, a losing team rather, and you've been a part of a winning team. And there's like a stark difference where you know right away whether it's a sandwich line, like an assembly line at Jimmy John's, or whether you're working for a Fortune 500. You know sometimes when you're on a winning team. And this was one of those times where everybody, even in a table read, sitting in bathrobes and snacking on fruit and nuts and, and trying to fix your Zoom and Wi-Fi, everybody was still treating that scrimmage like it was the Super Bowl or the World Series. And I think that's what you hope for. You hope for people that are going to make bold choices, people that are listening and engaging and they're present and they care a lot. And that, that way, like... When you walk into the process, you're you're like, okay, everybody's trying to win a championship. Um, Paul, there is such lack of vanity in your portrayal. Um, you know, tell us about that, and also the fact that, but once in a while, there is this sympathy that we we 
get from your character? You know, can you tell us about? Hopefully the sympathy is less about what I'm doing on screen and more about the fact that I hope folks who watch this show or any are able to see humanity and know that you're not born evil. That's not really a thing. Um, I think, you know, the lack of vanity is something I'm attracted to, obviously. You know, like uh, all the actors I love, it's not like I grew up going, God, I want to be Robert Redford. Nothing wrong with Robert Redford, great actor, great filmmaker. Thank you for the Sundance Film Festival. Um, but I was always more attracted to Paul Giamatti in Sideways and uh, Phil Hoffman in Almost Famous. And, you know, there's a dishevelment of either spirit, mind, or the literal visuals. And so with Larry, it's like you really got to just kind of own it and not be afraid of being judged, which is tough because we're people. We want people. To, we want. I want everybody to like me. And... Uh, all right, let's do it. And we love you, Paul. <laughs> and I love the red I, suit. Thank you so much. Yeah, shout out to Dina and Jack, who make me look like a real human sometimes. But I, I feel like the lack of vanity is something I'm attracted to. Like I, comedians especially, like people look at a Kristen Wiig or a, or a Kyle Mooney sometimes, and it's like, well, they do comedy. But like that lack of vanity is, there's bravery in that. There's bravery when Brad Pitt is like, I'm going to go do Burn After Reading in 12 Monkeys. Because he can look pretty all day long, but like, so, it, there is something to leaning into that. And I think we all have versions of that, either visually or in a choice instinctually, that, that we allow to, to kind of crack the glass. And I, I just really, I, I'm attracted to that, I suppose. There was a moment where I improvised some weird thing I don't know what to even call it, but I beat my fists against my inner thighs while miming some sort of rough child's interpretation of a sexual encounter in episode six. And it was, I didn't fully know what it was. I just did it out of instinct and character. And I knew that, I knew it made me feel uncomfortable, so I knew it would make <laughs> Taryn and the crew feel uncomfortable. And I did it not fully knowing what it was, but knowing it came from some place of erratic behavior and arrogance and, and anger. And then when they kept it in the show and I was able to watch it, I was like, oh, I, I know what that is. Mm -hmm. I only knew it until afterwards. So, so that lack of vanity helps you get into a lane where you go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go at this speed even if I'm not looking at the speedometer. Yeah. Um, Taryn, speaking of anger, in third episode, no spoilers, you latch on to anger beating up that guy and you go to really ugly corners can you tell us about tapping into that anger uh yeah um yeah uh um would you can you show us <laughs> yeah. you do it uh yeah i guess i'm not as Affable as I pretend to be. Uh, no, I, I um, it's in, again, it's in the script. So, you know, um, that episode is my favorite, actually. And it's my favorite because it's the one that most prominently features Ray Liotta. And it's about, for my character, it's largely about um, him being forced to confront the reality of who his father is. And it's about the loss of innocence, and it's about him having to be the father in the relationship. And I think what Dennis does so elegantly and I so relate to is Jimmy sees his dad in all of his glorious imperfection, and Jimmy can't quite deal with it. And um, he sees it as weakness, uh, and what he does is he's not really getting anywhere with um, infiltrating Larry. And so there's this sort of moment of, this perfect storm moment where somebody is unkind to Larry and Jimmy's just f looking for an outlet. And he sees an opportunity to defend Larry and potentially ingratiate himself. And he sees a place to pour anger and to pour rage. And this guy's obnoxious and like not that big. <laughs> um, 
he's just a horrible man. And Jimmy just lets him have it. Jimmy's the real guy. was very, very, very capable of looking after himself. That's part of the reason he was selected for the job. And he just pours this pain. It's pain. You know, he pours this pain into this guy and lets him have it. And, and what happens is you see Paul's amazing. Paul is watching and is so kind of almost, almost, it almost looks like he's sexually excited by it. You know, it's this this weird. Yeah, Larry probably. Larry, Larry, probably Larry for sure. Like yeah, yeah, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely Larry. <laughs> but it's this weird. <laughs> it's all character. It's all character. But um, yeah, uh, it's a. <laughs> You guys are, I, I'm making I, light I, of it, but one of the things I love about the, your complex relationship is that there is sexual tension between the two of you. I, th I think yeah. there was, I don't know what you, your character is thinking, but in when I was doing Larry, it was very much, there's something alluring about if you're the outcast or the nerd in a high school setting or whatever, if the jock or the, the prom queen girl or whomever is nice to you, it's almost like it's validating your, your, your worth in some capacity. So the fact that he is so much like, hey, tell me about digging graves and cars, you fucking weirdo. <laughs> um, that, that sort of weird, like, aggressive interest that that probably was bordering, if not uh, literal, uh, sexual arousal, because it's like, wow, this pretty thing is treating me like I'm a pretty thing, and that I think we can all relate to that on some level, obviously, whether we'd say um, it or not. Which leads me Just to a question I want to ask uh, Sepa. That um, this this whole show bravely tackles male toxicity, and you're the you're the female lead the only major female character amongst all this male. What was it, your experience from your vantage point? I mean, I felt lucky because I never felt what Lauren felt in the workplace. I always felt incredibly supported, heard, encouraged, um, on set by the producers, by Dennis, by my colleagues, everyone here on stage, and everyone beyond. Um, so I, I feel fortunate. Um, Lauren didn't have that fortune. And you see, it's subtle, but you see the sort of progression, the way she develops a thicker skin, maybe, from the beginning of her career, um, when you see her um, uh, witnessing, you know, and uh, you see the dynamic between her and Miller in the dining, uh, um, the diner scene, and her witnessing Larry's interrogation, to the points in which she is recruiting Jimmy. Um, it's kind of night and day in a way, even though it is a bit subtle. Um, she's much more eager, wide-eyed, um, cherubic, and then later on, she's tough. She is impenetrable. She's in control of every situation. And I think every woman can relate to this, is that you have to, you do, whether you choose to or not, adapt to the environments that you're put in. And she's in the FBI in the 90s, and she's not only a woman, but she's a woman of color. And from all of the testimonials that I've read, the people that I've spoken to, it's, it's not easy if you're a man. It's impossible as a woman. And um, just to be taken seriously. And so um, I felt, like I said, fortunate to have such support and encouragement as an actor, as Sepida. But as Lauren, it's really tough, you know? And so you can't let anything show. You can't let any of your feelings show. Um, and it's intimidating. I mean, she goes so to, to such extreme that she even intimidates Jimmy, you know? Um, so I had fun playing with that. At the same time, in episode three, at the end of episode three, you see that, that sort of the wall crack a bit. She's actually deeply concerned for Jimmy. She's concerned at the choices she's made. You know, there's a point in 
which she says with Miller in episode two, you know, it's his problem. He's the one that's, you know, dealing, do dealing drugs mm. to half of Cicero. It's not my problem. He chose that life. And then you see a 180, really, at the end of episode three when she visits um, Jimmy in the maximum security prison. And, and she actually doesn't know what's going to happen, and she cares deeply. Mm -hmm. She can't show how much she cares, but she does in that moment. Wow. Um, last question to all of you. You all individually with this story navigate really dark corners. Finding out what happened to Jessica and the details is harrowing. Were you guys able how was it for you guys to decompress and walk away from what you, the subject matter and what you guys were involved as actors? Greg? Well, I mean, I, you know, Miller in a way is outside the ecosystem of, of these two, you know, and, and in a way, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, it was good for me because uh, I, I, it is very, very tough subject matter. And, uh, you know, I, Miller discovers Jessica, obviously. Um, and, you know, kind of the through line of what this is is unavoidable. And I, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, I think what, going back to what Seppi said a moment ago is, is you, you know, you sometimes draw the lucky lottery card. And I feel like across the board, we had a very strong group of people working on this and, and, um, and a great camaraderie and trust. And so I, I think that was the uh, life preserver in all of this. And, you know, certainly I think Paul uh, and Taryn can talk more specifically about some of that stuff that went down in the prison because that that was that those were days that I wasn't around and uh, I, I I can't imagine because what happens on screen is pretty powerful but uh, for me it was a um, you, you know you're always hoping to find stuff that's interesting different um, uh, powerful and meaningful as, as a story and, and this certainly fit the bill but in terms of what we were dealing with uh, nobody was unaware of of um, the darkness of the subject matter, um, Paul. What, in particular, this the I think what what I forget what the episode is where you actually tell us what five where you tell us about Jessica um, was how how were you able to deal with that scene? Um, there's like so many things I could say about the the sort of tending to or not tending to of the darkness of the production, um, the story and whatnot. I think if, I, if I'm trying to give a real answer and not like say something to make people think I'm a good actor or say something to make people think I really went there, quote unquote, all I'll say is uh, the truth is that the, our show, our show deals with something really, really, really uh, dark and difficult and harrowing and, and scary and whatnot. Uh, I think our current, this is a dated story, you know, this happened in the 90s or whatever. So um, I think the current climate is that we're all kind of doing fast food outrage right now in our culture. It's very much like I'm going to get really congruently mad about something trivial in the same breadth and, and engagement I would with something that's actually catastrophic, like um, anything from foreign policy to uh, acts like Larry carried out. So I think there was something refreshing to having uh, a means with which to really tell a difficult story and to expose that darkness. And to, not to mention, we have redemption in the end. There is redemption in this show. This isn't just an ooey gooey serial killer, watch me uh, put my footprints in the blood puddle type of show. It's not. It's, uh, it's got something to say. I think Dennis says it well. And I'm grateful to be a part of that version of that kind of a story because uh, the world itself is getting real dark and real needlessly divisive and they're making a sport out of outrage. So. I look to a show like this and I go, hey, here's something to actually be outraged by. And, uh, and let's put men in check uh, to different degrees of whatever their toxic masculinity is. 
whether it's just in a cubicle environment or something as, uh, you know, psychotic as Larry Hall. What did I just say? What I really said was, um, I, I, I think, I said a lot, but what I'm, what I'm actually trying to say is, there's a lot of purpose in this darkness, and to relate it back to my life and others, it's like, there's purpose in your pain, I believe. I believe it's something to mine and something to tend to. Yeah. And I think we, we told a story, a dark story worth telling, not in some horror movie fashion, but with some redemption. You, I never see one of the murders on this show. I just want to point that out. That's a very good point that Paul brings up. It's like there's a lot of true crime stuff. They they air it out. They they feast on it. And Dennis's primary job in this was to keep that off screen and did an incredible job considering the stakes of what we're dealing with. And it's even more harrowing as a result because your imagination goes so much further than what you actually see. The four of you are just give us a master class in in acting. It's incredible. Uh, the, the four of you, the performances and the ensemble, the way you guys work together is remarkable. And Paul, you're a massive talent. Yeah, <laughs> massive. Yeah. And you, my friend, yeah. are one of the preeminent moderators in this entire United States. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thanks guys, for, coming for being out. here. Thank you for coming out.